Hello guys, how you doing? I'm going to continue reading um, Britain, the key to world history by Commons Beaumont and I'm just going to recap what the guys' theories so far are in the book. Um, Commons Beaumont believes that Shetland was the home of civilization. Um, he thinks it was highly civilized up north in Scotland, and it was like a it was Atlantis. They reckon it was Atlantis, um, but some celestial disaster happened, like a, a comet smashed into the the north and made a whole um, population move south to England. Avebury. So he's connecting the stone circles in Shetland with Avebury. And he also reckons that the the people that moved from Shetland were descended from Abraham, from the Bible. Um, it's it's kind of on the lines of what I was thinking, but I think he's looking in the wrong place. I was looking on um, Google Earth, and although Shetland sounds like Sethland, I think he's looking in the wrong place, really, with it when it comes to the, those islands. I think he should be looking more at the Isle of Lewis, the Western Hebrides in Scotland. There's a lot more. Um, there's a lot more clues in Lewis than there is in Shetland. But I still think I still think there is some truth to what he's saying, because um, I've already connected British history with the Bible. I think that um, I think there's some truth to the fact that up north, the north of Scotland, in the the Western Isles, Shetland, uh, Shetland Orkney, I think there was a civilized um, race of people. But for whatever reason, whether it was a volcano, a comet, I do think they, 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 they pushed south um, and established places like Avebury, like Stonehenge, because the stone circles up the north of Scotland are older than Stonehenge. They're older than the pyramids. They're some of the oldest structures in the world built by man. And um, I can see where he's going with this. But I still can't connect Hebron. He's trying to say Avebury was a new Hebron. And I was looking, and I, I don't know about that either. But I think he's onto something because I've, I've, I've came across quite a lot of stuff in Lewis. Um, the author, Commons Beaumont, he says that the, the Greeks and the Romans stole the pagan Celtic stories and turned it into their own. And I thought that was a bit far-fetched. I, I, I realised that the Celtic culture might have been stolen by the Romans. Because when the Romans came to Britain, the whole of Britain was Celtic. The whole of Britain was Celtic. Um, but they, the Romans, Romanised most of Britain and pushed the Celts to the edges of Britain. Like Scotland, Ireland. Well, Ireland never got disturbed. But the Western Isles in Scotland. And I think this is where Christianity comes in, guys. Because I think Christianity in Britain is probably was probably the purest form of Christianity before the Romans got a hold of it. I think the Romans got a hold of Christianity and turned it into something else. Took it back to Rome, put all these places, Palestine. They put their own places in, in place of the British places. So I think the Romans came to Britain, took Christianity away with them, and perverted it to their own means. Um, and there was a lot of monasteries and churches in Scotland that never got touched by Roman influence, and they still practised original Christian doctrine, um, which is different from the Roman Catholic version. So... I can see the Bible 
been a story of people, um, but not from the Middle East. I don't think they're from the Middle East. I think they're from Scotland. Um, there's a few clues. There's a few clues. There's definitely a few clues in Scotland. And when you look at the Scottish Christianity, the Celtic Christianity, there's so many saints, guys. There's so many different saints I've never heard of that you did you don't hear in the the, the Roman Catholic version. Um, you've got saints like I've, I've wrote some down. Saint Bridget. Any of you heard of Saint Bridget? I'll get into Saint Bridget soon, but Saint Bridget. Um, you had Sony, which was Johnny or Saint John, but it's spelt Gaelic. Saint Sony. Saint Molag. This is an interesting saint, guys. Saint Molag. Um, and it, it kind of ties in with Moloch, like Moloch. Saint Molag and Moloch. But that's another Celtic saint, Saint Molag. Dalrada was a saint. Saint Serf. Saint Serf. Saint Andrew. Adom Nan. Adom Nan. That was another saint. Saint Mongo as well. So these are a few saints in the Celtic Christianity that the the churches still linger in Scotland today. Um, like I said, I took tons and tons of my, my own research. I was research. Some Google Earth taking place names. I've I've got three pages of research that I've done yesterday. Um, but I think the author comments is looking in the wrong place, he's looking at Shetland, I think we should be looking at Lewis in the Western Hebrides because he reckons Hades is Staffa he reckons Avebury's Hebron um, what I think he's right about the author is the Chaldeans the Chaldeans were meant to be the original Babylonians the Chaldeans were meant to be the people I think Abraham came from. And when you look at the word Chaldean, it's very similar to Caledonian. Um, if you look at Chaldean, then look at the word Chaldees, then KLD, this is Gaelic, KLD, but KLD, then you anglicise it to Caledai, Caledonia. So you've got Chaldean, Chaldees, Kaylee D, Caladai, Caledonians, which is Scotland. So are the Chaldeans the Caledonians? And this is. And I think Iona, Loch Leven, there's, there's lots of places to look at these defined clues. I also found a Babel in Lewis, a Babel. I found Europe, Europa in Lewis, but it's spelled um, Gaelic, it's Europaid or Europhaid. And it's like the Greek goddess Europa. I think that's the only one that he's got right so far when, through my research, is there is a Greek goddess. Um, called Europa. In Lewis in Scotland but there's lots of St Kilda that island St Kilda in the Western Hebrides as well guys St Kilda is packed with clues packed with clues and you just, it just makes you wonder sometimes guys how did Christianity skip most of Europe end up in Ireland into Scotland then England and then the rest of Europe how did, like, they say they jumped on a boat from the Middle East and came all the way around, or North Africa to Spain and from Spain up to Ireland. But, guys, what if, and this is this is chucking, chucking it out there, but what if true Christianity began in Britain? The Romans came over, were still pagan, thought, how do we unify? 
they took the Christian Celtic, Celtic Christianity, added their own spin to it, added their own places to it, to match more where they came from and closer to the Middle East. But what if the original, the original religion, the original Christianity, Celtic Christianity, stemmed from Celtic paganism? And I wouldn't be surprised, guys, if Celtic Christianity, the, the fact that the Celts eventually believed in a monotheistic God, one God, you wonder if the the events that happened up north, if it, if it was a comet slamming into the sea or if it was a volcano going off, if you wonder if these people, because they make sacrifices, they were making human sacrifices to the sea, to the land for a better harvest, for better, they were making sacrifice to the sea for seaweed so they could um, use the seaweed as fertilizer. So they were, they were sacrificing in the sea and in the land. But what if one year they, they were sacrificing and they still never got their crop, they still never got, and they got maybe a natural disaster and they thought the gods were angry with them. And they thought, well, obviously sacrificing isn't the way. There is only one God. Maybe that, that was the theme of it all, that these people up north had to move because of environmental issues, either tsunami, volcano, comet. They had to move south. And as they moved south, they, were, they pushed their own religion. And it's funny, guys, there's a BBC documentary right now called Britain's Ancient Capital, Orkney. And in this documentary, and it's brand new, guys, it's brand new, they're, they're coming up with brand new theories, and it's, I've been thinking this for a while, though. They're saying that there was a stone circle cult, a stone circle cult, and they reckon this stone circle cult started in the Orkneys in Shetland and then moved down to Stonehenge. This is all mainstream archaeological science. They're saying this, it was a stone circle cult. Well, I think the Stone Circle cult could have been the, the characters from the Bible. Abraham, his, his followers, Jacob, his sons, whoever, the whole. And these people might have not existed. They might, these names might have just replaced the real names, the real Celtic people. Um, but it's not far-fetched to think that, that maybe the Celts were the first to adopt Christianity and then the Romans took it from them and bastardised it, took it back to Rome, spread it, made the Pope a fucking walking God and stuff like that and the people in Scotland rejected it, totally rejected it. Uh, I think that's not a far-fetched theory. Anyway guys, I'll, I'll, I'll go to Google Earth and show you some of the stuff that I found. Yesterday I spent all day researching Google Earth, trying to find places that resemble places in the Bible or names. And you find with Shetland that a lot of it was Vikingized, like there's a lot of Viking influence, so a lot of the names changed because of the Viking influence. But if you go to the Western Hebrides, uh, where Lewis, Staffa, St Kilda, all these islands, you find that there's a lot of Gaelic names still intact. And Gaelic is an old language, an ancient language. So a lot of these names are still intact. Um, Anyway, we'll have a wee look. So I'm enjoying the book. I'm enjoying the book, but I think he's maybe veering off a wee bit with the Greek stuff. I think he could be right with the fact that the Bible tells the story of British, ancient Brits moving from north to south. And what if, guys, when you think about it, I, I thought about this too, like the Queen, the Queen of Britain, the Queen of England, the Queen of Britain, she reckons her ancestors were King David and Saul. And to me, that was puzzling. How could the Queen of Britain be descended from some king from the Middle East? Well, guys, what if, what if this king from the Middle East wasn't from the Middle East? What if he was a British king? The first king of Scotland was called David. The first king of Scotland was called David. So what if these Jews, these so-called Jews, these Hebrews, 
Hebrides, Hibernia, Hyperborea. It's funny because there's an island at St Kilda called Borea. Uh, what if these people that the Queen descended from, these ancient Brits, weren't Jewish or Middle Eastern at all? They were Celts. They were he they were Hebrews, Hebrides, Celts. That's not a far fetched. That that sounds more plausible than the Queen being descended from a Jewish king. A Celtic king sounds more likely. But anyway guys, we'll have a look. We'll have a look at the Google Earth. And I'll show you some of the places I've discovered. And it's interesting, really interesting guys. This Babel, this this is Babylon place in Lewis. It's crazy. You've got upper Babel, southern Babel. And I found a massive landmark, like in the ground. It looks like there was maybe an ancient building of some sort. And it's not even marked on the map. It's not even marked on the map. And it's, it's I think it's, it's quite large. It's about 90 metres wide. All the, way, all the way around. Anyway, guys. Right. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Right, so the author of the book. The author of the book reckons. Reckons Abraham came from Shetland because they were called Seth. Sethland. <laughs> but apart from the fact that Shet and Seth sound similar. I can't find really any other links because as you can see guys a lot of these names are um, Vikingized. Some of them are still intact, some have remnants of what they were called before. But a lot of places in Shetland are actually Viking, like Bresse. Say, that say at the end, that's a, that's a Viking. If you see anything with A, Y at the end, you know that's a Viking name. So, I was looking about the Shetlands and I couldn't really find what the author was talking about. There is, apart from Seth and Shet, that's the only similarities I could really find. But, in the Isle of Lewis, there's tons, guys. There is tons. Like the, the author mentioned that the the Greeks stole the god Europa from Scotland. And funnily enough, guys, there is a place, and this is Gaelic, Europe, but it means it's the same. If you type it into the Google, it, it means Europa. It's a goddess of the, the sea. Well, she was the daughter of the god of the sea. And the god of the sea in Scotland was it called Poseidon. He had a different name. Um, he was called Shawnee. Shawnee. Which in English it's Johnny. And they reckon it could be something that it was St. John. Maybe St. John came from this god. But also he was talking about Ness as well in Shetland. But there's a port of Ness here. And Lewis. And guys, when you think about it, the word Lewis, Lewis, L-E-W-I-S, isn't that a lot like Levi's? E-L-E-V-I-S. Levis, Lewis, Levi's, Lewis. As you can see here, guys, These are Gaelic names. These are proper Gaelic names. You can see that they've not been affected by the Vikings. A lot of these names are hard to say as well. Probably harder than the, the Greek stuff. But anyway, on the Isle of Lewis, you've got a little island peninsula.
Why is it not letting me drag? Anyway, guys, look at this. Isn't that a lot like Babel? Babel? Upper Babel? Lower Babel? There's Lower Babel. And there's Babel. Which could be a lot like Babel. Lower Babel, Babel, and Upper Babel. And look what I found here, guys. This is interesting. This here, this landmark. You can clearly see that this was a circular... A circular structure of some sort. The remnants of a circular structure. And it's pretty large. It's pretty damn large. You can see... In comparison with the houses on the right, these buildings on the right, these are houses, the size. In fact, I'll measure it for you guys. So from this side to that side, you see. That's 543 feet for our Americans. That's 165 metres wide. 165 metres wide. So guys, this is pushing the boat out a bit, and this is a wild theory, but could this be the original spot for the Tower of Babel before, before the big catastrophe that affected Northern Scotland? So that was an interesting discovery I made. It links in with the Bible. Is there's a Babel. A Babel. You call it Babel? Babel? And um Where was the there was a place called Five Penny. This was interesting as well, guys. Jesus, it's taking me to England. I put in the, the Gaelic name for it. It's called Koi. But there's a church dedicated to St. Bridget. She was an Irish saint. Um, Trying to find it. I'm sure it was further up here. The Moloch, St. Moloch. That was an interesting one as well. Anyway guys, I'll get back to it because my fans went on because it's obviously a lot for the computer to handle right now, all these windows open. But I think the author should be looking more at the Hebrides because um, St. Kilda as well, guys. This was... This is an island here, St. Kilda. This is where all the the Chaldees went, apparently. The Chaldees were meant to be holy men. 
they were trying to escape the Romans. But this place is very interesting, St Kilda. And I said to my missus last night, I went, St Kilda? Who was St Kilda? Who is St Kilda? So I, I, I looked up St Kilda. He wasn't a saint. He wasn't a saint. There was no such person as St Kilda. <clears throat> what Kilda means, it, it comes from Childa, C-H-I-L-D-A. Kilda and Childa, Kaldees, Kali Day, it's the same thing. So St Kilda is actually the Chaldeans, I think. This is where the original Chaldeans came from, I think. St Kilda. Because St Kilda, there isn't a saint called Kilda. So it's just Kilda. Turn that to Childa, C-H-I-L-D-A. -D then you've got Kaylee Day. Like Childa, Kale Day. Kaylee Day, Kaldees. These are companions, it means companions of God. So the the Chaldees were companions of God and the Chaldeans were the sons of God, practically the first sons of God. So it's, it's pretty interesting. I'll, I'll go more into the, uh, the Moloch stuff later. And there was Saint Serf. That was an interesting one. He was a apostle of Orkney. Saint Serf. He was meant to be son of Iliad, king of Canaan. So Saint Serf, son of Iliad, king of Canaan, and he was apostle of Orkney. So guys, I think, I think this is interesting. I'm not sure if the author is completely correct, but he's definitely on the right lines. I think we. There's oh, there's a. So we island here called. Borreri, Hyperborreri, Borreras, anybody? Yep, we have Borreri here. Borori, Borori, Ganets over Borori. Stack and Armin. Look at this place. Amazing. Amazing place. <clears throat> Some of the highest cliffs in Britain are here in St Kilda. So I think Although the, the author is on the right tracks, I think he's looking in the kind of the wrong place. I think the Isle of Lewis, Iona. Look at that, that's Can Cana. That's a bit like Canaan. Cana. Yep, it's definitely interesting, guys. So anyway, I'll get back to the book. Raze, Ra, Se, see that, Ra, Se. But it's amazing to think that these islands are massive to you. I, I didn't realise, being Scottish myself, you don't realise how big these Western Hebride Islands are. They're huge. Look at, look at that, that one island. And you can see, guys, on Google Earth, the light blue represents shallow water. The, dark, the darker the blue is, the deeper the water. So you can see here, guys, all the light blue around Britain. That was probably land that joined onto the mainland to Europe. Onto Norway, onto France. And you can see it probably joined onto the islands above Orkney, Shetland and the Faroes. And possibly... 
Greenland and Iceland. It probably all joined up into one. And you can just look at the seabed like these things here, this huge seamount, this huge seamount that risen, it just raised through volcanic activity. You can see there's been something going on in this sea. But we can have a look at Avebury if you want, guys, before I start with the book. This is where the author thinks Hebron is in Avebury. And it is an amazing, it's an amazing place, Avebury. You can see here, this giant circle. This is a circle of stones. See the people living within it. These are, these are, this is a giant circle of stones. And you can see close by, they have mounds and hills. This one here, this one, Silbury Hill, this is the biggest mound in Europe. Man made mound in Europe, this thing here. Silbury Hill. Massive, massive. It's like a, it's like a British pyramid. It's huge. And this Silbury Hill, this is part of the Avebury. There's lots of other little mounds like this all round. If you if you have a look, um, there was a crop circle here. Yesterday when I was looking at it, it must have updated. There was a crop circle in one of these fields the last time I looked at it. There's no here anywhere. That's strange. And it was like a, it's funnily enough, it was like a Starry David crop circle. It was in that field. So Avebury. Ancient Britain, but still not as old as the circles up at Scotland. Right, guys. I'll be back in two minutes. Okay guys, back to the book. Like I said, I don't think everything is correct that the guy's talking about, but I've had um, suspicions for a while that the Bible is based in Britain. Most of the characters are probably British and it's been taken away, given a mid Middle Eastern twist, added um, extra characters, but I think it was all based in the British Isles, with British people. I think this is where he's right. Anyway, this is part two of the, the Garden of Eden pages. I now propose to take the subject a step further, relative to Abaris and the Israelites at the very eventful epoch of their history as related by Manetho. After describing the oppression 
exercised by the detested Hyksos against Egyptians and Mesmerites. Part of these lands had seized and colonised. Manetho says that they dominated those territories for 511 years in all, their usurpation being terminated by a terrible and long war when the kings of Thebes and others rose against them and finally drove them out of the country. In the course of this long war, the Hyksos were also expelled from parts of Egypt and were shut up, besieged in a place that contained 10,000 Arura. This place was Abaris. The name of the king who vanquished the Hyksos is given in given as Alis Phragmuthosis, Alis Phragmuthosis, but who is generally known as Amos, Amasis or Ames. The king who founded the 18th dynasty of the Thebans and the first of the Ramses, which king was duly succeeded by his son named Thumosis or Tethmosis. Of Abares, Manetho says, the shepherds built a wall around all this place, which was a large and strong wall, and the city, Thamosis, attempted to take by siege and storm with an army of 450,000 men, but failing in this, he granted terms to the besiege. He then continues, A composition that they should leave Egypt and go, without any harm to be done them, whithersoever they should, they would. And after this composition was made, they went away with the whole families and effects, not fewer in number than 240,000, and took their journey from Egypt through the wilderness for Syria. But as they were in fear of the Assyrians who had the dominion over Asia, they built a city in the country which is now Judea, and that large enough to contain the great number of men, and called it Jerusalem. We know now from the OT, Old Testament, that there was such a long drawn out war between the Israelites and Philistines, the latter people properly described by Josephus as Egyptians, which in the time of Samuel led to grave disaster to Israel, to such an extent that Samuel, albeit unwillingly, agreed to anoint the brave man Saul to become its military chief and bestowed upon him the title of king. How David, with a strong body of followers, treacherously opposed Saul and became a guerrilla force on the side of the Philistines, and how, seven years after his own accession, Israel was in so precarious a situation that David came to some arrangement with his enemy and led his tribes, or such as followed him, out of the Canaanite lands to Jerusalem, which he captured at the point of the sword. Manetho explains why David was forced to quit. Incidentally, the Jer- Jerusalem to which he repaired lay much further distant from the original Canaan than the twelve miles which the alleged Hebron is distant from the more correctly named El Quds of our time. These long and savage struggles had previously led to such severe defeats of Israel that the apprehensive people demanded a younger man to conduct affairs as a warlord than Samuel, and the patriarch had found it expedient to succumb to their clamour, but whose resentment is clear enough in the tirade he uttered, in this war magic was used by the Israelites, one example of which when the Jonathan and his arm, armour-bearer crept along the rocky gorge of Michmash not far from the famous Agilon, until the Philistine sentries challenged them. Then the two Israelites, the Philistines termed them the scornfully Hebrews, rose up on their feet and slew, the slaughter churning up the ground as though it was newly ploughed, accompanied, accompanied with a trembling and shaking in which the enemy seemed to beat down one another. In the result, about twenty being killed suddenly, and the survivors panicked. Can it be reasonably explained by any other means than that Jonathan hurled a grenade or explosive missile into the Philistine camp? In their battles, the Israelites used the Ark, which was no other than a munitions chest. When the Philistines were defeated by its means, they lamented, Woe unto us! Who shall defeat these mighty gods? The flash of fire, the noise like thunder, the missile directed at them which exploded. What were these but emanations of mighty gods? Nonetheless, it would appear that in the days of Eli, the Ark failed to possess its magic powers and was no longer produced in battle, probably through neglect on the part of the Levites. That's what it's saying. The Levites, Lewis, seems awfully similar. Josephus describes a war which resulted in the expulsion of the Israelites as a great war. Let no one suppose it was a small army of Philistines that came against the Hebrews, he says, but all Syria and Phoenicia, with many nations beside them. 
This reveals a general determination to expel them from the country they had occupied for so long. In the end, besieged within the walls of his capital Hebron, David capitulated on the terms which agree with Manetho and seem generous. He was permitted to collect all his people and march away together with their wives and children, taking all portable property and retaining their arms. They went to Jerusalem and seized it with little difficulty from the Jeb Jebusites, and it is somewhat peculiar that immediately these Hebrews, broken by the Philistines and having trekked to a distant region from their starting point, should discover this convenient country at their disposal, and also at the hand so powerful a friend and patron as Hiram, king of Tyre, yet so it is described. <clears throat> there is another peculiar feature of this exodus. How far actually lay Jerusalem from the area from which they had been expelled? A passage in Josephus suggests its distance from Hebron as a good deal more than a dozen miles. The people of the country say it, Hebron is more ancient than Memphis in Egypt, and accordingly its age is reckoned at 2,300 years. They also relate it that it had been habitation of Abraham, the progenitor of the Jews, after he had removed out of Mesopotamia. <clears throat> they say his posterity descended from thence into Egypt, whose mountains are to this day shown in that small city. Nothing in the foregone passage indicates that Hebron stood on the doorstep of Jerusalem, but the reverse. For if words signify anything, Josephus speaks of it as though it lay in some distant country, nor would have been surprising for it would have been plain futility on the part of the Philistines if, <clears throat> at the end of this extended and vindictive war with the Hebrews at their mercy, they should have been content to permit the enemy to set up another kingdom anywhere within their sphere of interest. In my reconstruction, Jerusalem lay over 300 miles distant. The compiler of the Book of Chronicles subsequently tried his best to conceal the immensity of the disaster the Israelites had suffered. The text suggests that the elders went to Hebron to anoint David as king, whereas he had been their monarch for over seven years. He says that the principal chiefs attended at Hebron at David's own command, who placed his plans before them. He does not exactly specify what these were, but after feasting them, he sent them back to collect the respective tribes who were ordered to return and assemble at Hebron. So is it evident, comparing the account with Menephos and Josephus, that it was affected by an armistice, since the entire object of the Philistines was to be quit of the Hyksos or shepherds as quickly as might be, for good and all. Josephus says that 357,000 armed men were led away by David, but it seems assured that a considerable number preferred to remain behind, subject to the Egyptians. Their descendants some centuries later to become a fresh thorn in the flesh to their conquerors. Zebulun was the only tribe to go unitedly, 50,000 of them, of Benjamin only, 3,000, of Simeon, 7,000, while Judah, so important, only amounted to 6,800 ready armed. Those who accompanied David took provisions and wine and corn and set out after three days feasting and, pre and preparation for the long journey. Manetho says that they left without any harm being done to them, as also Chronicles implies. The Hebrews appeared to have been treated with extraordinary clemency for those harsh times. For one thing or another, it may be considered that the powerful influence of Hiram of Tyre was behind this leniency. From the foregoing, not only is it apparent that the Hyksos were the Israelites, as Josephus himself states, but they migrated to a new region some considerable distance from their previous state, a factor in the past which Bible students might perhaps consider. The fact is the divinity students are afraid to question biblical history or chronology, or else their built-up fabric is liable to fall to pieces. No such qualms deter Egyptologists in disclaiming Manetho, although, without him, they could never have compiled a dynastic list of the kings of Egypt. This attitude is omitted as witness Bakey, a recent authority who says bluntly, Manetho gave us 30 dynasties as a framework within which to fit the story of ancient Egypt, and then adds, it has been the fashion to deride Manetho as an historian. Nonetheless, their own interpretations are open to serious question. Considerable license has been permitted to Egyptologists 
because they concern themselves with a form of scientific research limited to a small body of archaeologists who seemingly agree tacitly among themselves to put forward claims of which a great many are purely hypothetical or based on false premises to an earnest student of these antiquities. The innocent Victorians swallowed with blind faith the surprising ease whereby from Champollion Pierre onward Egyptologists have professed to translate from hieroglyphic monuments and papyri with almost as much certainty as a modern linguist can translate one living tongue into another. Behind it all lay, and still lies, the object of throwing a clear light on the accuracy of Bible history, and to the archaeologists, for the most part, to write anything which confirms Moses and Bible history generally induces pious folks in both hemispheres, and especially in America, to su subscribe large sums for excavation purposes to those who claim to be able to reassure them from any agnostic doubts. In some cases, these archaeological claims are absolutely dishonest. In others, excavators and so forth are led astray by their own enthusiasm. Sir Flinders Petrie was a notable offender. He knew the value of publicity and how to titivate the taste of interviewers and the ignorant public. One such, such example may suffice. He claims to have found evidence in the desert of Sinai on the site of a town which was said to be Anthelon and which flourished, according to him, in 1212 BC. Traces of a nightclub, including sets of dye, ivory counters and plain pieces of blue glass. He didn't know if a nightclub fl flourished there over 3,000 years ago, but it made a good story and obtained cheap publicity for himself. Today, when discoveries in other directions do not coincide with our assertions, doubts have begun to arise as to how far the accuracy of Egyptian archaeology may be accepted. Consider the material they have to work on. To begin with, there is the question as to what cl classification the Egyptian language belongs to. For the partly mutilated Rosetta stone, despite its three inscriptions, one in Hieratic, one in Demotic, and one in Greek, whilst they gave a clue to certain letters or sounds based on the rendering of Greek names like Ptolemy and Cleopatra, did not assuage all doubts. The Egyptologists finally had to fall back on the assumption that there was no alphabetical code in ancient Egypt, but about 2,000 signs, some being ideographic and others phonetic, i.e. some idealistic signs and some pronounced independently of the signs, and when the problem had been resolved, in so far as it was possible, the next step was to discover what language system it represented or resembled. That's the Egyptians without, where without an alphabet is incomprehensible in view of the fact that one of the most respected of early beliefs was that they were taught letters by the Ethiopians, as to which we have the record of Diodorus already mentioned. The Egyptologists decided, after various searches, that the hieroglyphics were based on the ancient Coptic, a late so-called Ethiopian tongue, more properly Abyssinian, which they classified as a member of the Hamatic branch of the African tongues. But it then appeared that the Coptic only began in the 3rd century AD and it actually became extinct in the 16th century. So that if it had been based on the ancient Egyptian language, it was at its best a debased dialect. The Coptic was a monosyllabic speech, the usual ca characteristics of primitive races and later became, so it was contended, very agglutinative, which complicated matters even more. Agglutinative signifies the combination of various words into compounds, each retaining its original meaning. Imagine, therefore, the pitfalls of the translator. For example, Chaucer, who wrote in English, a living language, only as far back as the 15th century, and did not use agglutination, is utterly unintelligible to those who read him back in the original without a glossary, whereas the Egyptian dates back, if only from Roman times, for some 2,000 years derived, it from a Coptic and a dead tongue without roots, grammar or alphabet. Nor is that all. Throughout the centuries, it is claimed the hieroglyphics altered and deteriorated from those of the 18th and 19th dynasties, that is, Ramses, showing signs of decadence until, under the Macedonian Ptolemies, they had acquired other characteristics. Many new hieroglyphics, were, we are told, were added and the style became overbearing and cramped, Added to all these complications, the script is without vowels except for an occasional final vowel, 
all of which offers an enormous margin for error, how largely guesswork can enter into translation. If, as there is reason to believe from those Egyptian words which have come down to us in the Bible, the Egyptians were of Celtic origin, and as to which more might be added, the basic language could scarcely have been African Hamatic, whatever that, that may signify, and it is more than questionable that this Abyssinian Copts were in any way Ethiopians, for the latter were the northern Phoenicians. For these reasons, any Egyptologist claim to interpret the past should be looked upon with the utmost reserve. To return, then, to the expulsion of the Hyksos of Israelites from the Canaanite lands, this relates unquestionably to the eighth year of David's reign, and for these reasons, presumably the Bibliolaterists refused to recognise that the Hyksos were the Israelites, although Josephus, the Jewish historian who preserved the records of Manetho, states definitely that they were the same, and in following the revised history, this is unquestionable. Lepsius, the German Egyptologist, whose knowledge of Egyptian lore was great and who tried desperately to resolve the vexed question of the Hebrews in Egypt in direction he was wrongly seeking, curtly dismissed the claim of the Hyksos because it failed to conform to the OT account, Old Testament. Not worth refutation, he says. The Mosaic narrative is entirely contradictory to it. Strangely, strangely enough, Lepsius, more than any man, was struggling to reach some understanding of Bible chronology and he had succeeded, he would have been seen that the Hyksos, as the Israelites, actually give the key to Bible chronology. After the Hyksos, who are termed Phenakim, or Phoenicians, in one passage by Manetho, had been driven away to Jerusalem, there emerged the new Mizmarite, or Philistine dynasty, whose leading prince had freed their former territories. It was called Theban, Ramesian, or Diospolite, the divine personages. And though it was termed the 18th Egyptian dynasty of the Ramses, it was more accurately Philistine, with its capital at Noamon, which appears was the original Philistine Gath. Adopting the god Ammon of Thebes or Shiloh, this seat of worship was transferred to Noamon. At Hebron, the fortress was permitted to fall into disuse. The stones formerly sacred to Kronos Saturn were ascribed to the Egyptian Hercules, and Rama, no longer of great account, declined and was called Ramses. Moreover, the new pharaohs annexed the divine status of the former Ram or Rama and became god kings, while the former activity in those regions dwindled until the time of Moses, over 300 years later all of which, according to the revised chronology, occurred circa 1670-1622 BC. Lepsius, although he vainly sought for Abaris in the Nile Delta, yet rightly believed that the city of Ramses and Abaris were identical, and cited Eusebius, who wrote, Jacob sojourned in Ramses, which was formerly called Abaris. The Reverend Mr Lawson also says, a writer on the subject of this name Rama draws attention to Ramses, or Ramses, a stone city in Egypt, and says that the ori Oriental geographers speak of it as the ancient capital of Palestine. The reference to a stone city points definitely to the city of monoliths, our Avebury. The 18th dynasty, the Ramses, or Ramesses, thus annexed the name, and what is more, assumed the mantle of divinity, which for five centuries had placed the Israelite judges in turn on so consummate a high as a living messenger or oracle of the god. Heirs to the patriarch Abram, the Ramses kings became the Ramas of the south as the hires of the Cushite Gad. As Diodorus stated that the Egyptian kings did so borrow from the Cushites and, as it appears, transferred the oracle of Ammon or Ham to the capital Gath, re renaming it No Ammon. It also been known as Rabath Ammon, where they piously preserved the iron bed of Og, a relic of the ancient patriarch whose claims to divinity they had annexed. Thus did the Egyptian or Philistine kings enlarge their stature to divine beings, and who of old time dwelt among the ordinary human beings as the Egyptian priests told Herodotus had happened. These Ramses, moreover, by the aid of magic in which the black art they became very proficient, but not proficient enough to, in the end, 
extended their power and influence until the collapse of the Asin ascendancy and the termination of the 19th dynasty 327 years later. For in the reign of Amenphus occurred the 13 years war in which the Egyptians proved inferior in armaments to their overseer enemies. The period terminated with the great catastrophe. The first of the Ramses dynasty which had recovered Mazarim from the Hyksos or Israelites were honoured as the deliverers and this tends to recall the mythical account of the seven against Thebes and its later renewal by the Ep Epigon or deliverers, son of the former seven heroes, behind it a long drawn out quarrel between Argives and Thebans. The Thebans according to Aeschylus regarding the Argives as a foreign speaking foe, they themselves being Phoenicians. The Thebans in this prolonged war, like the Israelites, used magic against the seven, such as when Capaneus placed a ladder against the walls, was destroyed by a thunderbolt, and as when Amphiarius, fleeing from the walled city, was suddenly swallowed up by the earth together with his chariot and horses, caused by another thunderbolt. Ten years later, the Epigon, having renewed the war, the Thebans, defeated in battle, retired behind their walls and consulted Tiresias, Tiris their seer, who foretold that the gods had declared for the besiegers and that there was no hope for further resistance. Thereupon, he sent a herald to the enemy offering to surrender on terms which, had, which were granted, whereby they were given free conduct to depart. He then moved to another region altogether with the families, and sought a domicile among the Illyrians in the same manner as the Israelites imposed themselves on the Je Jebusites. The parallel is very near, and allowing for the loosenness of Greek mythologist Etibus, who defeated the Sphinx, Goliath, in the first place, was in old age betrayed by his son's answers to David. It is the Bible story in epic form. The Cadmean legend has its sequel related by Herodotus when he says the Cadmeans, driven out of the country by the Argives, found shelter among the Enchiles in Illyria. This in turn bears close relation to the fable in which Cadmus, crushed by the terrible doom that weighed upon his city of Thebes, retired among the Enchiles or the Enchilians of Illyria, where his son Illyrius was born. There is another allied myth to the effect that the Cycloc, Cyclop Polyphemus of many legends had three sons by Galatia, Rhea Sibyl, consort of Cronus, who were named Celtus, Gallus, and Illyrius, and funnily enough, most Celts, the Gales, you see Galatia, that was in Spain, that was a place that was inhabited by Celts. That's where the word Gallus comes from, Galatia. Celtus, that speaks on its own, Celts, and Illyrius, and you get the I, what, Illyrius, the Iberians. In this latter legend, Polyphemus appeared to Asonum for Cadmus himself, who in turn has been shown was Abram, and leads to the conjecture that, the, that as the parent or patriarch of the Celts, Gauls, and Illyrians, a distinction which should be noted, the Salatus of Manetho should have been properly Galatus, possibly a copious error. Galatus and Galatia prov provided the eponyms. Where do these traditions take us? If Cadmus were the sonum for the removal of the Israelites expelled from Hebron, the country of Illyria takes place of Jerusalem. Such at least is the interference I must draw. The question then arises, why Illyria? What has or had Illyria in common with the Hebrews in Jerusalem? In a revision of ancient geography, neither Greek nor Roman Illyria were where they are assumed to have been. Pausanias, in a passage, hints, for example, that Joppa, it's funny because there's a place called Joppa just down the road from Edinburgh, here, that Joppa, the port of Jerusalem, was in Illyria, and we have a strange reference in St. Paul's epistle to the Romans to like effect. Who also were the Enchiles or Enchilians? They bear a near resemblance to the word English, an ancient nation known to Scandinavia as Engels. Leaving aside for the time being, 
the question of Cadmus and the fate of his descendants. The question now arises as to what constituted the territories from whence the descendants of Abraham were expelled by the Mesmerites, if they are transplanted to the broad acres of southern western England. Bible accounts of certain sites are often contradictory and uncertain, but it is reasonable, reasonably correct to say that for the purpose of, of this work, we may describe early Israel as bounded on the north by the peak area of Derbyshire and Worcestershire, and southward by the English Channel, except Dorset, Cornwall and most of Devon. North of the Marlborough Downs, incorporating most of Gloucestershire and the territories east of the Severn, lay the fertile Bashan, also known as the land of Argob, over which the old ruled Og, who, according to the book of Joshua, dwelt in Ashdod or Ashtoreth, which I believe was the original Sirencester, or Sirencester. He also ruled in Mount Hermon, another name for Ammon or Shiloh, the sanctuary of the god. It was bordered on the east and southeast by the chalk hills of Gilead, noted for its herbage, otherwise the Marlborough Downs, and adjoining it lay Sharon, or Saron, where the royal herds were pastured, namely Salisbury Plain. The Moabites accompanied roughly the present Berkshire, stretching as far as the River Thames. In the west was the Sea of Galilee, otherwise the Bristol Channel, and certain very vital cities lay in Somerset, really belonging to the Philistines or Egyptians, including Bethel or A or Agilon, of which more presently. Bashan's rich pastures and forests were renowned. Its oaks to the psalmists and prophets were its chief glory. And the smooth downs, Mishor, the plain, was a place for cattle, like the Marlborough Downs. Bulls and rams of Bashan were a byword for excellence. Gilead, the chalk country, where stood Ramah or Ramoth Gilead, was also famed for its cattle and herds like Saron or Sharon. It would be recalled that when Abram and Lot first settled in the south and abode on a mountain between Bethel and Ai, or Hai, their herdsmen fell out and so they parted company. Abram went to Hebron, but Lot selected the region towards Sodom or Kadesh. Josephus tells us that Lot's descendants, the Ammonites or Moabites, were inhabitants of Bashan. Gad also accompanied a large part of Bashan, as far as Salaka and Gilead, and its eastern border stretched down to the outskirts of Sharon. Incidentally, there are no chalklands in the modern Palestine, and very little grass will grow there. From early times, the Israelites of Hebron were bitter enemies of both Ammonites and Moabites, the former being allied with or closely related to the Philistines. I have indicated as a region of Bashan what today is England, is known as the Great and Fertile Midland Plain in the same way as Coela Syria, as Jophesus says Bashan was later named, was also called the Great Plain. It may possible, possibly be that descendants of the original Hyksos or Israelites yet form some proportion of the inhabitants of the Midland Plain. Those who remained behind, for some of them, when David led his followers to Jerusalem, later than the 6th century AD, a native people named Hwais or Hwikas, dwelt in the countries of Worcester, Warwick and Gloucester. Gloucester. We gather from the venerable bed that they had a king and were ruled by chiefs and that they were subdued, if not destroyed, by Caolin, the last Saxon king, in a battle fought by him against the kings of Bath. Cairncester Kern and Gloucester were defending their rights. The ancient diocese of Worcester was called Episcopalis Hucorum, and these Hwikas have represented the last vestiges of the Hyksos, their Egyptian name. If we attempted to fit these Bible regions into the present Palestine, it is immediately apparent that they refused to tally in any possible manner with the Bible accounts. In Bashan, for example, was the valley of Thamnas, Thamna or Thamnatha, lying between the Great Plain and Saron. In Timnath, as the Book of Judges has it, dwelt a fair Philistine maiden of whom the hero Samson was enarmoured and where he slew a lion with the strength of his arm alone. It is possible that this place is represented today by the ancient little township of Kirklade, lying between Kirin's 
Kirinchester and Avebury, whose parish church is dedicated to Saint Samson, of whom we possess no cognizance as such. The young Thames flows through this town, but as late as AD 905 it was pillaged by the Danes who came upstream in their shallow boats. This name, Thamnas, is very close to our Thames, and if the elusive Saint Samson were originally the Danite hero Samson, the Hebrew Hercules, it fits in completely with the surrounding topography. Kirklade may have derived its name from Eric, a variation of Hercules, Erk, Eric, Erich, and a laid, a stone to which the parish church contains certain very ancient and obscure Celtic engraved stones. It may be useful here to interpose some remarks about the hero Hercules and the hero Samson in view of the fact that Egyptian Thebes, our Avebury, was closely associated with him. Although the Greeks only regarded him as the greatest of heroes, the Egyptian placed him among the twelve gods who ruled before Osiris. His peculiar distinction was that he represented divine strength, something infinitely beyond the capacity of other human men. This strength was associated with immense pillar stones, sacred to him, like the pillars of Hercules, which stones were endowed with certain magical qualities. This cult of the divine Hercules was paramount in Tyre, the greatest city of the ancient maritime world, where the god was given the epithet of Melquarth, and the Tyrian coins symbolically employed the design of two pillars, each being intertwined with celestial serpents, thus indicating lightning or divine fire. That the origin of the idea of the pillars of Hercules was attrib attributed to Thebes appears from the account of Arian, Arian that when Alexander the Great led his army before Tyre, he demanded permission to sacrifice in the temple of Melquarth on the grounds that he believed that Hercules of Tyre was identical with that of Thebes. I contend that the association of Thebes with Hercules was own to the presence of those great Sarsons who so lavishly scattered about the era of Avbury, Avebury, and that there is a link between the Hebrew Samson and Hercules, as in the sixth of his exploits, Samson removed the pillars or gates from Gaza to Hebron. Professor, Professor Ignaz Goldshire says of him, The most complete and rounded of solar myth extant in Hebrew is that of Samson. A cycle of mythical conceptions fully comparable with the Greek myth of Hercules. In many cases, their exploits were very similar and both heroes slew a lion by tearing asunder his jaws. Nor is the introduction of Hebron or Thebes without significance. Samson was the Danite hero par excellence and we have the Greek tradition that the sons of Dan, Danios, fleeing from Egypt, Egyptus, settled in Hellas for centuries, were compelled from their lands by Eurytheus and returned to Thebes, their original home, and who, in the Earth story, from thence migrated to Scandinavia, named after them Dane Mark. Consider that the tribe of Dan, when Hebron was the capital, produced a hero named Samson, who later became immortalised as a hero or god, that the tribe of Dan called themselves the Hercules, because Hercules or Hercules was their own hero, and that they claimed the epithet as their own because of Samson. I might add that, in my former volume, I have shown how thoroughly the legends and traditions of the Hercules, or Danai, or Dedanan, belong to the folklore of the British Isles. I need to read that book, actually, his, his previous one. Classic knowledge where the early Egyptian sites in history are concerned must have been mainly from hearsay. Both Strabo and Ptolemy indicate the Cythriotic Nome, whose capital was Hercleopolis, city of Hercules, or Hero Ompolis, city of the hero, where also was the Abaris or Avaris, and Josephus states that when Jacob and his sons appeared before Joseph when they went to Mizraim to beg food, the meeting took place at Hero on Polis. Despite Strabo and Ptolemy, no trace of the city of Hercules or of the hero exists in the regions of the Nile, but visitors are shown mounds of rubbish near Anaz el Medina, 65 miles south of Cairo and east of Fayum. Although the Sethroitic Nom is placed in the Nile Delta, both cannot be correct. The modern authorities of the various dynasties, such as 
Mariette, Lepsius, Wilkinson and Brugge termed the 9th and 10th dynasties the Herculopolites, but Manetho knows of no such dynasty. They identify them also with the Karba of Egyptian and Cabanus of Assyrian inscriptions, vouchsafes, Baedeker's Guide to Egypt, but all is vague and uncertain, as it is that they place Thebes at the far south end of Egypt, the Sethriotic Nome at the other. Where was Abaris, and yet identifying with the zone near the Fayum, south of Cairo? Hecolopolis or Heronpolis was, of course, no other than Rama, later Ramses, Avebury. And you can see, you can see how maybe um, the hero Hercules is maybe related to Avebury, um, like giants. Like there, there was, there was, there's always these sort of obscure theories that giants built these massive monolithic structures of the stones because they couldn't figure out how just your normal human could erect such massive monoliths. So stories of people with great strength and giants kind of formed around these giant stones. And Avebury with um, Stonehenge, you wouldn't you would be surprised if there's some kind of um, relation to Hercules down at Avebury. Anyway, the great stones of Avery offer unmistakable clues to the real trend of prehistory. Though the long century of paganism stained with human sacrifices to those of Christianity, the chained stone monster, most venerable of its order in the world, still retains the vestiges of a long past and points to Britain's prehistoric role as the founder of civilizations. So this is part three. The Vishutids of Bath, city... Of Ammon. Gotta have a quick drink of my coffee. <sighs> Goodbye. Although Abraham prepared strong defences at Hebron in the event of enemies approaching from the north or east, the book of Genesis envisages his early and strong interest in the land of Havalah, which according to it was situated in the Garden of Eden. In the same region, among others, was the famous city of Ai, also called Hai or Ayath or Ajalon, and those in close proximity to Ai was Bethel, the place of the stone of Jacob. While well, nearby was Beersheba, and not far distant was the Philistine city of Gath, its stronghold and capital. And funnily enough, guys, Scotland, we, our most prized possession is the Stone of Scone, which was meant to be the pillow stone of Jacob. It's held in Edinburgh Castle, and all the royals get anointed on the stone. The stone's placed under the throne, and they're anointed. Um, so there's another link to Scotland and Jacob and Jacobites, the Jacobites in Scotland. Why were they called the Jacobites? Jacob. And not far distant was the Philistine city of Gath, its stronghold and capital. In addition to these, there flourished not far distant another city of great fame, providing a link with the Atlantis of Plato, namely Gades, the city of Gad, known also as Tartessus or as Tarshish. Its earliest Bible name was Sodom destroyed by the hand of God, by means of fire from heaven. The name Sodom signifies the city of the south. It is this region I propose to examine for further clues to the prehistory of Britain, as culled from biblical Greek and native sources. When Abraham and Lot parted company, the latter patriarch moved to the plain of Jordan and termed it the Garden of the Lord. Pitching his tent towards Sodom, whose descendants, according to the same book of Genesis became the Ammonites and Moabites of the important tribe of Gad, whose totem was the old lion, and who were Cushites or Chaldeans, and were told that its later borders reached to Jazar or Gaza, all Gilead and half of the land to Aror, before the opposite Rabbah. Another mention is made of Gad's northerly 
boundary in Ezekiel, which lay, which lay, it is said, over against Hamath, the river to the great sea, the name Hamath, or great Hamath, prefixed by the words, the entering in, signified a river estuary, the equivalent of our word mouth of a river, but sometimes the word was employed to indicate a port at the mouth of a river, it explains why Solomon, whose maritime trade with Tarshish, or Gates, the city of Gad, was so closely associated with the long treasure voyages to Ophir, built store palaces or warehouses at Hamath for the returning vessels, cargoes. That most important river mouth, which I shall endeavour to show in due course related to the mouth of the Bristol Avon, maps of the present Palestine based on the Old Testament fail completely to indicate any of these points and wrench Gad entirely away from its true situation. In the immediate vicinity of Hamath was Tarshish or Gadis, and not far away, closely associated with it commercially, was Gath, which, as I have suggested, was later renamed No Ammon or Rabbath Ammon, the very important first capital of the Egyptian or Philistine pharaoh. The first word Rabbath applied to Ammon and sometimes used alone as Rabbah, populous or from the root Rab, prophet or teacher. The Ammonites, as was mentioned, were worshippers of the god Ammon or Hermes, and it would appear that generally Gad was closely associated with the Ammonites. Rabbah Ammon, from very early, early times, was the capital of a king, and in the reign of David was described by Joab as the royal city and the city of the waters, which he besieged for so long. Bible students apparently fail to recognise that no Ammon and Rabbah Ammon were one and the same. It is not surprising that, in the confused and misleading geography and territorial distribution accorded to the present Palestine, no Ammon is generally regarded as a name for Egyptian Thebes and Rabbath Ammon as the city of the Ammonites is placed on the arid re regions east of the Jordan, for which error, as in many similar instances, the Romans, probably in the time of Constantine the Great, are partly to blame. Nevertheless, a careful examination of Bible references should make it plain that they were one and the same. The description of No Ammon by Nahum gives some idea of its true situation, and he also stresses it as a city of the waters in proximity to the sea. Comparing it with Nineveh, he says as follows, Art thou better than No Ammon that was situated among the rivers, that had waters about it, whose rampart was the sea, and her wall from the sea, Cush and Mizraim were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Ludum were her helpers, yet she was carried away, she went into captivity, her young children also were dashed into pieces at the top of the streets, and they cast lots of her honourable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. Such was the fate of No Ammon, the former great ruling city, at a critical period in the history of the world, that this city was identical with the Philistine Gath, as indicated in more than one passage. In the savage wars between Philistines and Israelites in the days of Samuel and Saul, King Achish of Gath held supreme command over the other Philistine lords, who nonetheless did not hesitate to criticise him strongly when he became the patron and friend of the renegade David, to whom he gave refuge and material assistance after the latter's flight from the vengeance of Saul. The Philistine lords distrusted David thoroughly. He offered, or pretended to offer, his assistance assistance to the Philistines against his own people. The Philistine Seren regarded his followers as undesirable allies. What do, these he what do these Hebrews hear? They demanded of Akish. Make this fellow return. Akish, king of Gath, certainly demonstrated great kindness to David during his years of exile. His life in continuous danger from Saul, for he harboured him for 16 months together with his two wives and 600 irregulars, presented him in addition with an estate and maintenance until the Philistine princes forced his dismissal. Yet for all that, we have David's subsequent unfriendly return for past favours, possibly in collusion with the Hiram of Tyre, whose, de whose dependent he was in effect, when deliberately he made war on the king of Rabbath Ammon on the frivolous pretext that when he sent emissaries to congratulate his son and successor of Nahash, because, he said, his father showed kindness unto me, the embassy, the embassy was roughly treated. Now, there is no Bible record of any such king as Nahash, 
nor any independent monarch who showed favours to David other than Achish, although we possess more details of David's youth and reign than any other king, so that no other king but Achish could have patronised the young upstart when romantic career makes him outstanding. In other words, Nahash, king of Raboth Ammon, was identical with Achish, king of Gath, and the two renderings are seen to be practically similar when the initial N in Namash is dropped. Such being the case, it is plain that Gath and Rabbath Ammon were one and the same, which explains the difficulty of the writer on the subject of Gath in Sir William Smith's Dictionary of the Bible, <coughs> when he admits that Gath as a name disappeared at a comparatively early date. Another example of their mutual identity occurs in the report of the War of Zea against Philistines, who broke down the walls of Gath, after which the Ammonites gave gifts to Uzziah, and his name spread abroad to the entering of Egypt, otherwise Great Hamath. Who were these Philistines? They were among the original Rephaim, or giants, who according to the Old Testament were the wicked men, destroyed by the deity because mankind had filled the earth with violence and corruption. The giant Repha, or Rapha, of Gath, and his four enormous sons, one having double toes and thumbs, originally gave the name Rephaim to the Hebrew vocabulary. The huge Goliath, the knight who challenged the best man among the Israelites to settle the dispute when the Philistines were besieging Hebron, who was preceded by his squire carrying his gigantic shield, was another man of Gath. That David held the Philistines as of great account as soldiers is demonstrated as stated by the fact that when a power in Jerusalem, he forced his royal bodyguard of mercenaries, including Cherethites, Cretans, Pel Pelethites, Philistines or Carians, and Gittites, men of Gath, of whom he employed 600. The Philistines were included ethnologically as Mesmerites or Egyptians. Josephus says all the children of Mesmerium being eight in number, possessed the country from Gaza to Egypt, although it retained the name of only one, the Philistine. They were the original, the, they were by the origin the Lelegies of classic note, another name for the Carians, from whom, for whom it would appear the Western Hebrideans and the Bretons are descended. The Philistines were a reliable, brave, warlike, chivalrous people, aristocratic, imperious and haughty, but with all generous, a formidable military power who could place 30,000 chariots in the field against Saul. They possessed warships and merchant vessels, conducted much commerce by land and sea, and Isaiah says that the land was full of gold and silver. Like other Egyptians, they employed oracles, soothsayers and seers, were addicted to the infernal deities, and made a boldness between the eyes and re religious ceremonies concerned with the underworld, the worship of Osiris and Isis. They may be considered the to provide a definite link with the underworld cult so widely spread in ancient Britain and in Ireland, and was also the case in the Mediterranean Egypt, which, much of which esoteric faith seemed to be centred around the original and prehistoric King Arthur. According to Mr Lewis Spence, King Arthur and Osiris were derived from one original. He remarks as follows, that Arthur and Osiris are indeed figures originated in a common source must be reasonably clear to the student of myth. Druidism is only the cult of Osiris in another form, and Arthur seems to have a common origin with Osar or Osiris. We've got a, an extinct volcano here in Edinburgh called Arthur's Seat. Apart from the esoteric resemblances between the Philistines and the legendary King Arthur, there are similes in more material pursuits. The Philistines were governed by aristocratic chiefs who stood in the position of feudal lords and might be acclaimed as the originators of the Code of Chivalry, for they, like King Arthur's bold knights, possess an order of knight, errantry. They even used the title of Sir, for the five Philistine lords were called Seren, the plural for Ser or Sir. Admittedly of the same race as the Karenai or Carians, to whom I have referred previously as dwelling in northwestern Scotland in the Isles, this people, says Herodotus, were the first to fasten crests on their helmets, put devices on their shields, and were a great maritime people in the time of Minos, as the Philistines undoubtedly were in the reign of Solomon. 
They were a very religious people according to their lights, moral and held adultery in the greatest detestation. Of all early races we know of, perhaps they were the noblest, who more than once showed their chivalry towards their enemies. They may surely be esteemed as a northern people utterly alien to all oriental characteristics. I suggest that they were Ionians by origin like the Athenians. So Iona is in Scotland. The geographical situation of Gath may perhaps be denoted, denoted in a passage of Amos when he says, Pass ye on to Calne to see, and from thence to Hamath the Great, and go down to the Gath of the Philistines. If we may regard Calne as referring to Calne on the Great West Road between Avebury and Bath, a very ancient township, Great Hamath, as signifying the mouth of which the Severn at Bristol. And Gath is the illustrious city of Bath, to which the traveller was to go down from Hamath, as would be the case on the assumption suggested here. These fit into the general scheme, and the description of Nahum, already cited of no Ammon, also agrees with the topography of Bath. It is situated among the rivers, and the Avon winds round about it. In addition to which prehistoric Bath had a rampart, part of the Wandsdyke, which seemed to have been guarded, the river approaches to the city of Burwalls, opposite Clifton, where the Avon narrows and becomes more shallow. Burwalls, or Borough Walls, was a strongly fortified Celtic fortress which commanded the high banks of the Avon towards its mouth at one point of crossing, and it might be described as her wall from the sea. Bath for many ages has been described as the city of the waters, and it's conceivable that Joab, knew of its thermal springs when he so termed the city of Raboth Ammon, although according to Geoffrey of Monmouth, the baths were first built by the Bladud in the 11th century BC. The names according to it, viz, Raboth Ammon and No Ammon, are, pos are probably not so obscure as they may seem. It was often the custom in biblical times to give additional con cognon cognomens to places such as in the case of Rama and Ramoth Gilead, or of Ashod and Ashdoth Pisgah, the springs of Ashdod, Rabbath or properly Rabbah, as I have stated, signifies populous, well populated, by extension a capital derived from the Hebrew Rab, a multitude or Rab, hence Rabbi, a teacher or prophet. No Ammon is more obscure, but if I I'm entitled to use Knossos as a clue, the city of knowledge, derived from the teacher Hermes, no Ammon, rendered phonetically like other Egyptian or Philistish, Philistinish words, which signify also the city of the one who knows, Ammon, whose divine powers in the south had been transferred from Rama or Abaris, the seat of Ammon's former oracle, and established in what had been Philistine city of Gath. It helps to explain why the relic of Og, or Abram, was preserved there. In the period and said into the great catastrophe, as I fully described in my previous work from the metaphysical point of view, there took place the Thirteen Years' War, wherein no Ammon or Rab of Ammon played a leading part in the struggle, to which it would seem the prophet Nahum was referring in the description he gives of our great men being led into captivity in chains. Amos, in a prophecy to be regarded like many similar cases, as ex post facto speaks of fire on the wall of Rabbath, which devours its palaces, of shouting in the day of battle and of its king and princes led into captivity, as says Nahum, who ends his account by stating that there occurred a tempest and whirlwind. Jeremiah reports an alarm of war in Rabbah or the Ammonites and pictures it as a desolate heap burned with fire. Ezekiel, who definitely classes no Ammon and Rabbath Ammon as one and the same, says, I will execute judgments in No, I will cut off Rabbath No, and I will set fire in misery. Sin shall have great pain, and No shall be rent asunder. The young men of Avon and Pesbeth shall fall by the sword, and these cities shall go into captivity. When we assemble the evidence from these sources, all pointing to one momentous epoch, stark drama viv vividly stands out. We may construct a situation in which the great city was besieged, its walls broken down by fire, suggestive of gunfire, 
The city then stormed and sacked, its king and chief men led away captive in chains as slaves. The city devastated and ablaze. But that's not the end. We are suddenly confronted with the words of Amos, Tempest and Whirlwind. Also, Ezekiel's No Shall Be Rent Asunder and I Will Cut Off Rabbath No. These sentences do not approximate to the fighting aspect, but to something unusual, hence too the use of the first personal pronoun restricted usually to a declaration by the deity himself. I will execute judgment and no, etc. It seems to imply that at the crisis in the fate of the city there was a tempest, a whirlwind, and that it was rent asunder by earthquake, for only such a conclusion would apply to these words. Meanwhile, adapting the statements of Ezekiel to the city of Bath, may it be noted that the names Sin and Avon are used in relation to Rabbath No. The, f the first may relate to the ancient Sion Hill of Bath, regarded by authorities as the site of the ancient citadel. And Avon, of course, can answer to the river Avon, which winds round the city. The word Rabbath may have been related to the populous city of Rab. A multitude from the last syllable Bath remains unexplained, unless it signified populous Bath. Yet it's taken in conjunction with Noah, Ammon, Rab, related to teach, instruct, implying divine teaching, prophecy, may seem more in accord. One of the gates of Heshbon, whence the road led to Rabbath, was named Bath Rabbim, which seems to relate to Bath, to sacred doctrine. Possibly, and purely conjecturally, we may exploit this name Gath by sharing off the initial letter, for Rolleston, an authority on the Celtic race, contends that the Erse is a purest surviving Celtic tongue in which names beginning with vowels were preferred to consonants, the Goyldils far later being addicted to the initial letters B, G, L and P, in which Gath becomes Ath. By extension, Athenae, other words Athens, whose tutelary deities were Athene or Minerva and Poseidon, both of whom appear to have acted like a role in regard to Bath. It is admittedly a slight clue, if one at all, to consider Raboth Ammon as a prehistoric Athens, but the prehistoric Athens and Cadmean Thebes was apparently not far distant from one another. That Thebes was traditionally in Greek myth overthrown by the men of Argos, and, if a co coincidence, Bashan was originally called Argob in the Old Testament, in addition to which the inundation of destruction to both Athens and Thebes in the Great Catastrophe, the Deucalion Flood in Th Thessaly was called Ogerian in the case of the two cities, and we may perceive the reason why this accordingly should have indicated the connection between Thebes and Rabbath Ammon as Athens. The possible link may be stronger yet, Rabbath or no Ammon, according to the prof prophetical works cited, became the vortex of a vital struggle. The climax to the 13-year war between the gods and the giants, in which the city fought desperately against invading hordes, strongly armed from the east. It stands out as the heroic, heroic city of the scriptural records, veiled carefully as they were, and it may seem to have performed deeds attributed to Athens by the priests of Sais, as recorded by Plato, who placed Athens in the island of Atlantis. The passage in question is in the Timaeus. For there was a time... Solon, before the great deluge, of all when the city is, which is now is Athens, was first in war and was preeminent for the excellence of our laws and is said to have performed the noblest deeds and to have the, the fairest constitution of any of which tradition tells. And when the rest fell off from her, being compelled to stand alone, after having un undergone the very extremity of danger, she defeated and triumphant over the invaders, and preserved from slavery those who were not yet subjugate, subjected. The priest of Sais goes on to describe how the warriors of Athens were destroyed in this deluge, like those of the enemy, and there is Bible evidence which indicates the same fate as overtaking both invaders and defenders of Rabbath, which is suggested that the prophets cited with the macabre intention of tempest, whirlpool, rent asunder and cut off, Surely such words were not merely loose statements to describe a siege and the sacking of a city. From British accounts so meagre of the remote past, there is little that can be claimed as relating definitely to Bath. Geoffrey of Monmouth indicates 
indicates it as an important city, the seat of a king, in the time of the first Trojan invaders, 1100 to 1050 BC, in which Baladud, cured from leprosy by bathing in the hot thermal waters nearby, in consequence established baths for curative purposes. The Fosse Way offers testimony <coughs> of its pristine importance, for the most important means of inland transport was not originally a road alone, but a canal, seemingly the centre of a chain of intercommunicating canals which served the Midlands and south to Seaton and extending northeast as far at least as York and perhaps farther yet. The name Foss indicates a ditch according to according a waterway and it passes through the centre of Bath from north to south. Indeed, Bath must be regarded as a focus of this traffic whence supplies from across the seas were taken to the Avon mouth where lay the great high seas ports. Thence up the Avon to Bath and barges, for it was navigable so far, and finally transferred to other craft to be taken eventually to their destination. It appears to the, the ditch referred to by Plato in his description of the advanced civilization of Atlantis. In addition, Bath was situated near the Mendip Hills, where lay valuable silver lead mines, regarded anciently as silver mines, which would create further traffic. This fair city laid waste many times in its past history long before Vespasian both destroyed and restored it, and who, or his sons Titus, was reputed to have built the Roman baths, was four centuries later again laid waste by invading Saxons. Bath is built in the decayed crater of a very ancient volcano. Its amphitheatre of hills like Lansdowne and Brecon Cliff have formed part of the original crateral walls. Formerly of the city spread northwestward to Sion Hill, and to Lansdowne, which dominates the city below. Collinson, in his well-known history of Somerset, says that Sion Hill or originally possessed fortifications, and this name, Sion, caption, Zion, God, may explain Ezekiel's sin. The strength of Mizraim, the citadel of No Ammon, olden days Bath, like every city of importance, possessed its fortress to which the people could resort in times of danger. Salisbury Hill, an almost isolated eminence to the northeast of the city, has truncated summit of 30 acres, but it bears of no trace of any earthworks and lies too far from the city proper to have been its fortress. Its name suggests a temple of the sun god, but the unknown god of Bath is represented by a large stone plaque of the head of a deity, with head and beard composed of fiery serpents. Some think it represents the sun, and it bears a close re resemblance to the coins of Rhodes, an island of volcanic character where both Helios and Poseidon were honoured, primarily the former, if we remember our Odyssey. In the Antonin Iter, the city is described as Aque Solis, the waters of the sun, and the Romans may have assumed that the British god Sul was their soul, and very likely he was, yet for all that it may well represent Poseidon. Linked with the unidentified deity, like the unknown god of Athens, was the goddess Minerva, or Athene, goddess of wisdom, and tutelary protectress of Bath, whose once magnificent temple stood in sight of present pump room. Her symbols, the helmet and owl, appear on many a scriptural stone. Sculptured stone. Like Bath, Athens was built originally in a volcanic site, and the ancient tradition had it that Poseidon and Athene vied with one another as to who should become its chief deity, a contest won by Athene. Bath in no way answers t t topograph topographically to the historic Athens, but the first Athens drowned in the Atlantean flood may have been erected on the site of Bath. I repeat it as merely as a possible hypothesis. Minerva's temple and bath stood on the east of Foss Way, near the midway between the north and south gates. Its portico was supported by large fluted Corinthian columns crowned with sculptural capitals. The frieze, says Collinson, was decorated with gigantic images, figures of birds and beasts, perhaps symbolic deities, and groups of foliage. There was found the immense head of the unknown god with his fiery locks, and also a head of Artemis, and, in addition, a Cadecus of Hermes. After the Roman withdrawal in AD 410, Bath's checkered career remains a blank, 
until it was overthrown by Caelan of Wessex, who took it by storm and left it in ruins, as recorded in a crude Saxon poem entitled The Ruined City, which even then must have retained some vestiges of illustrious past. The verse is as follows. Strange to behold is the stone of this wall broken by fate. The stronghold is bursting, the work of giants decaying. Roofs are fallen, towers are tottering, and mouldering palaces are roofless. To what giants does the Saxon poet refer in this lament? At all the events, as late as the reign of Henry VIII, certain antiquities had survived the holocaust of war. It was still a walled city, and by the north and south gates, Statues of Muro and Gravens displayed with other objects, a head of Hercules and near it a whole length figure of Hero strangling two serpents, a foot soldier with a sword and shield, several foliage wreaths, two images embracing one another, two heads with ruffled locks and a running greyhound. Near the west gate was a Medusa head and also a lacoon of Troy encompassed with serpents between the north and west gates, cupids with wreaths of wine leaves and two images, one grasping a serpent an oblong stone with a st statue of Persephone, consort of Pluto, queen of Hades, with her cornupia, cornucopia thrown over her left sho shoulder, and also another Medusa head shaking her shaky, snaky locks. Taken altogether, these relics give an impression of not being the usual type of Roman decorations, but more like would be expected of Trojan survivals, such as L Lacoon and the Medusa heads. Collison says that the British name for Bath was Sayre Paladoa, <coughs> derived of course from Pallas of Athens, which might be translated as City of Pallas or the City of Wisdom, but it should be recollected that the statue of Pallas also defended Troy. With her vicissitudes, unlike cities in Greece and elsewhere, Bath refused to expire. She was too vital, situated in the heart of affairs in the ancient world, and today, exalted and venerable, she yet thrives as one of the oldest and most beneficent cities in the history of the past. I recommend Noble Bath to you as the heroic No Ammon city of the Philistines, an illustrious and enterprising people who closely concerned with King Arthur. So this is now part four. Gades or Sodom or Avonmouth, we will pursue the antiquities of Wessex in relation to Abraham, his Israelites, and misery. So, page 96. I'll have a wee rest here, guys. I'm going to have a cup of coffee. And I'll be back soon with another part. Cheers.